right with everybody? We will be recording this webinar. Hi, so I'm Amber Wheeler and I work for the Food Foundation and Peas Please. And uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this last in our webinar in our series, this the Veg Summit series um, on healthy, a healthy horizon for horticulture, um, where we're going to be exploring some of the good practice around um, increasing production and consumption of fruit and vegetables at the same time. Um, we'll be looking towards the Netherlands, but we'll also be looking at some of the good practice across the UK. Um, so please put yourself on mute as usual, uh, but feel, feel free to put, have your videos on. It'd be great to see your lovely faces. And please feel free to put your questions in the chat um, if you have any. Um, if you put a queue in front, that would help, but don't worry, um, we'll try and spot them. So just to give a little bit of context, as Veg Facts that came out a couple of weeks ago showed, um, and as P, uh, Peace Please has recognised for some time, um, if everyone were to eat five a day tomorrow, there wouldn't be enough fruit and vegetables available. There'd be about, about a million tonnes not enough. And if they were to eat seven a day, there'd be about three million tonnes not enough. So we recognise that in order to increase consumption, co production has to go hand in hand, availability has to go up. So all the speakers who are talking today are involved in this, they're involved in that increasing production, but also linking it to increasing consumption. And that's what we're interested in in Peas Please is drawing it all together. Um, so delighted to have with us from the Netherlands, Karen Bemmelmans, who works on the Dutch um, Action Plan for fruit and vegetables, and she's going to explain a little bit about what they've been doing. Um, they've been a Peace Please pledger from the beginning, um, and that is to share insights and collaborate. So delighted to introduce Karen, who will give a short presentation. After Karen speaks, there'll be a five minutes to ask us some questions, and then we'll move on to the other speakers. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and uh, good afternoon for the people in the Netherlands, if they are there. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction, Amber. It's always great to uh, work together with uh, uh, the Peace, Peace and Food Foundation partners. Um, uh, so the Dutch vegetable industry, united in the Fresh Produce Center and the Dutch National Action Plan, uh, made the pledge together for Peace, Please in 2017. And as, as part of this pledge, we promised to share best examples for increasing consumption. So that is what I'm asked to do today. I will share with you two of our uh, examples from the uh, last, from the recent years, which we are find very promising in uh, stimulating consumption. So my speech is not about stimulating production, but focus on stimulating consumption. Because if you all know, the Netherlands are a large global player in producing food and vegetables. We have a lot of variety of products here year round. So we are not so worrying about production, but more worrying about stimulating the consumption. Uh, so two examples I would like to share with you. But first of all, the Dutch National Action Plan for Foods and Vegetables, and you can you give me the next slide, thank you, was launched in January 2017. We are a collaboration between uh, growers, fresh, the fresh produce sector, retail, government and non-governmental organizations with a common objective to contribute to the health of the society by stimulating foods and vegetable consumption. And this action is really needed also in the Netherlands. Uh, next slide, please. Because also in the Netherlands, we don't meet the recommended daily allowances for vegetables and fruits. We eat on average about 130 grams of vegetables, as, and we are expected uh, with our guidelines to eat 250 grams. So there's a big gap in what we want for a healthy and sustainable diet and what we are eating at the moment. Um, but if you, as you know, eating habits, next slide please, eating habits are hard to change. They are, uh, we learn that when we are young to eat and uh, like vegetables and fruits. And on, uh, when we are getting older, they are very hard to change. Uh, the approach we choose in the Netherlands is inspiring consumers and helping them uh, to eat more fruits and vegetables. We choose in our communication strategy, choose color as a leading team. 
foods and vegetables come in all colors of the rainbow. They add color to your meal. So choosing more color on your plate during your day in all places you are eating will help you to increase your consumption. The slogan choose color is adopted by many parties, by retail and fresh producers. Some examples on this slide. On the left, it says today is green. It's some green uh, uh, recipes and in-store promotion also using choose color. And on the next slide, you can see uh, that we are using choose color on all our social media activities and it's also used by retail partners in their social media activities. It's a very common use slogan at the moment. Um, the Netherlands is a proud partner also of the International Year of Foods and Vegetables, which the United Nations launched this year. They also use color as a main slogan. And so that's very nice that I have the same idea about uh, using color to stimulate food and vegetable consumption. The actions we are doing this year are more focusing on giving color to each other. So help other people to eat more food and vegetables. And on October 14, we will have our second national food and vegetable inter day in the Netherlands with more than 100 partners. We will try to have all Dutch people at four o'clock eating one piece of food or vegetable on October 14. So that are our, our, our upcoming uh, events in 2021. But I think you all know, for changing behavior, more is needed than only inspiring uh, and addressing consumers. Our environment is a very strong factor in driving our mostly unconscious behavior. Supermarkets are in the Netherlands, main places for buying food and vegetables. So they can play an important role in stimulating us to buy more. And because we're having this unconscious, unconscious behavior, what we are trying to do is to see if we can people uh, help people to buy more fruits and vegetables, but not by pushing them. The strategy we used is nudging. And as you all know, nudging is the aim to influence the choices we make without taking away any product or without taking away the power of ourselves to choose. So we can choose ourselves, but we, have, we are nudged to make maybe another choice. And this nudging strategy, we tested in an experiment for six weeks in a real supermarket. We were very glad that the Dutch supermarket allowed us to have their store and really uh, put in a uh, different type of nudges in that store. And we did this test in 2018. I will discuss the niches you see on the screen in a minute. And now we are testing the same thing in a web shop and in an app, so in online shopping. But first of all, this, this shop we used for six weeks and we designed about 10 different, uh, about 10 different niches. On the left side, on the top, you see the first one. That's a large floor sticker at the entrance with pictures of fruits and vegetables, getting you in the right mood, getting you in the mood to buy vegetables. On the right side, there you can see the shopping basket and trolley saying, this is the place where you have to put your fruits and vegetables. We put posters outside in the supermarket with information about the most popular foods and veg in the supermarket. And we use, on the left side, the big one, social norm communications. So billboards which inform you about the behavior of other customers, saying other people buy four different food and veg. What are you buying? And then we did, uh, on the right side, on the uh, on back, uh, down, we say uh, through the supermarket, uh, with small shelf cards saying this product is also tasteful with a uh, combination of food and vegetables. For example, with bread or with eggs or with all different kind of products, you find this suggestion to use food and vegetables with them. Online, we did the same thing. We developed six different niches. Next slide, please, Indy. And uh, so online, uh, we had uh, uh, this billboard. This first one is when you started the app from this grower to uh, put in your order then you see a, a first screen with fruit and vegetables also to get you in the mood to buy more fruit and vegetables uh, it says 80 percent of the customers are buying fruit and vegetables and want to eat healthier 
And on the other side, we show you that if you're searching in this app for a specific product, for example, this is the example with X, then you'll see all the X this, uh, this uh, supermarket offers, but you also see a little banner saying, put uh, some fruits and vegetables with your X. So all these different suggestions. Then we had, it's not on the screen, uh, when people are buying, they see an icon, a green icon, where they put fruit and vegetables in their basket online. So the icon was not blue, but green. And at the end, there was a meter showing that uh, how much they have bought compared to other buyer, buyers, also this social norm. For these two experiments, the nudges are all applied at once. So in the results, we can't make a difference which one is more effective. Uh, to evaluate the effectiveness, we have a control su supermarket included to uh, make sure that we can account for external factors such as the weather. And in the online experiment, we work with the A-B test. So some of the people show the banners, the nudges, and half of the customers don't, don't see them, an A-B test. We got all sales data uh, from this supermarket for all these weeks. And in addition, we had a questionnaire administrated to measure customer satisfaction. And I'm very glad that the results are positive. Next slide. So the nudges indoor in the supermarket store itself show a large effect on the shopping behavior. Uh, we registered that there were 3.3 kilo more uh, in volume sold on fruits and vegetables per 100 cash registers. Uh, for the result, we also analyzed the uh, shopping experience of the customers and they were not negative. They were even more positive. They liked that they have seen so much food and vegetables all around. Uh, so indoor, it seems to have a big effect. Online, we are just in the middle of analyzing all the data. And the meeting I had before, one hour before, I just saw the first one. And I'm also very glad to can tell you that they have a huge effect on the shopping uh, of the customers in this test. And we are looking, and uh, it's not for publishing yet, but we think it's about 7% more sold online when you have these nudges there. Uh, but we will, um, we hope to have the report finalized in September and then share, of course, with the Food Foundation to have, uh, uh, to have this result out there. Um, so positive results with nudging in supermarket. And we are very glad that the supermarket we did the test with, it, with the six, six weeks experiment, just this year announced that there are three of these nudges are uh, implemented in all the supermarket stores. So they are really implemented. Uh, for uh, to be in that supermarket store. Um, then the second uh, example I would like to share with you, just a few minutes, um, and that's nudging on the menu. If it works in the supermarket on the shelf, can it also work uh, in the menu? And then we have, we call this our McDonald's case, because uh, we had an expert, expert meeting uh, in the Netherlands uh, talking about how we can make food choices in food, fast, fast food restaurants more healthier for children. And we discussed the well-known happy meal. In choosing this happy meal, there are four steps that you have to go through. And in these four steps, there already was the possibility to choose fruits or vegetables. But it was also uh, possible not to choose one of them. And in the discussion, we convinced McDonald's that they can do more to help uh, people uh, choosing a better option. And then they changed the choice structure of this happy meal so that in step four, the only choice you got was uh, a food or vegetable option. Meaning that from then on, from June uh, 29, every happy meal sold in the Netherlands contains at least one portion of fruits or vegetables. They sold more than 12 million happy meals every year. So that's a large portion of fruits and vegetables sold extra in the Netherlands. We find this an inspiring example and an easy win-win situation which could be reached by working together with all parties. Uh, and in some closing remarks uh, at the end for the last slide, of course, last year we had this new reality with COVID. In a very recent study, Dutch consumers reported that they are eating healthier since consumer, 20% uh, eating healthier, and 12% unhealthier since the pandem pandemic. But we see in all our sales figures that consumers cooking and eating at home has a positive effect on the food and vegetables sold in the Netherlands. There were more than four percent, there was four percent more sold in 2022. And of course, we know that due to the closing of working places and restaurants outside the home, 
the fruit and vegetable salt were less. But if we, uh, if we have that in account, then we still have a plus 4%. So we see that that has a positive outcome. The challenge is, of course, to keep this positive effect without Corona, to hold the momentum and not falling back in old habits. That's uh, the lesson we learned from uh, almost four years of Dutch national action plan, that what is necessary is really working together with all the different parties out there. And we know that cooperation pays off. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Karen. That's there's such a lot in there. Um, such such love, fantastic insights from from yourselves. Um, there were some questions in the chat, and I was wondering if I could um, sort of bring it in by asking about um, the work with retailers. Um, and was there much resistance um, from them in terms of because we know that um, a lot of money is made out of unhealthy food. Has there been um, much resistance from them in terms of the fruit and vegetable um, promotion you've been doing? Yeah, no, there's no resistance because the people we are, are talking to in the retail are also the people who are uh, accountable for the food and veg sold in the retail store. But what you probably see is that we, uh, so we are very happy that we have this uh, retail change allowing us to do this experiment. Then we show them the positive results. And then it was quiet. Nobody was implementing them. And that takes, and I, I want to stress that, that takes a lot of time. And it's behind closed door. We don't know what they're talking about. And we were very surprised that after two years, it took them two years to discuss this internally, that are now putting out these niches in all their stores. So I think what I've learned is give them some time. But uh, <laughs> be, stay knocking on the door, but give them some time to implement. I saw also some questions about the McDonald's Amber. I see them on the screen. And of course, I can. Uh, what, what, what McDonald's did was only in the Netherlands. They changed its choice structure for the Nether, for all their restaurants in the Netherlands. I don't know if they are going to implement that in all of Europe. So before we had the discussion with them, uh, people can choose fruits or tomatoes in two different steps, but you can also choose uh, a soft drink or uh, um, a dessert. And now they changed that, that in step four, you only can choose tomatoes, pieces of foods of uh, complete foods. So that's what they have do done in the Netherlands. And it's still out there. It's over already one and a half year. Right. There was also a question about the um, the long term evidence. Are you looking to gather the long term? evidence? <laughs> yes, uh, that's uh, that's uh, the theory about nudging is that it only works in the first few weeks. And then maybe people are or even unconscious don't see it anymore. So what we have learned is that we would like to change the type of nudging. So maybe we have another banner or another, and that's experiment we are looking forward to do next year. So for now we see, uh, if you look at the six weeks experiment, the biggest effect is in the first three weeks, but after three weeks, there's still an effect. And in the online experiment, we see we, we can't see that yet because we are analyzing, analyzing the data. But we think, we, we all feel that after three weeks, you have to change the matches. Okay, um, we've got time for one more question, which I'm gonna choose from the chat. Sorry, can't um, answer all of them, but maybe we could come back to them at the end. Um, if you grow a lot of food, how accessible is it to consumers other than supermarkets? Have you had more local growing or allotments in recent times in the Netherlands? Yes, market, for instance? yes, yes. I think yeah, we see the same effect as in the in the UK. I think we have uh, not only the supermarkets, but also local markets and also growers who are selling from their own for from their own business directly to consumers. So it has. On every corner, I can't say on every corner in the Netherlands you can buy food and vegetables. It's always very close by, oh, and you can buy it by the growers themselves also. And yeah. all they all they all reported an increase over 2022, and not only in supermarkets, but they all imported in, uh, reported this increase in 2021. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so just quickly, maybe from Jack, how is the initiative financed and can you give an, as an indication of the amount of money involved? That's a quickie and then we'll move on to Sarah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's of course because it was a, an experiment, a pilot, that this was financed from the Dutch National Action Plan with some finance from a Ministry of Agriculture. So it didn't cost the supermarket any money. That's, that's correct. 
Mm -hmm. and the producers, did the producers put in any money, Karen? No, they didn't put any money in it, but they helped us in contact with the retailers. So they were the ones who asked retailers, please, can you join us with this experiment? Yeah, that did work well us, yes. Okay, great. Good that you can stay till the end and um, be part of the, the discussion at the end. But next, I'd like to move on to some of our UK um, initiatives. Um, so we're going to hear from Sarah Gould from Tuvi Cymru. Tuvi Cymru is Grow Wales in Welsh. Um, and they've been going, she's going to tell you a lot more about it, but they've been a pleasure since the beginning of Please, Please. Please and they are funded um, to support the development of the horticulture sector in Wales. So delighted to have Sarah with us, who I think is going to show us a little film. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Amber, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. So, yes, the plan is to tell you about Tevi Camry, what we've been up to, our commercial horticulture action plan in Wales and our recently formed Wales Horticulture Alliance Group. But firstly, I'd like to show you a film we've put together of two of our commercial Welsh horticultural businesses and the challenges and opportunities that they face. You might recognise some of the stats, Amber as you're going through, because there's a few, few in there from Food Foundation. Hello, my name is uh, Adrian Marks, and uh, we're here at Bellis Brothers Farm Shop and Garden Centre, and we're situated in Wrexham in the northeast of Wales. Uh, we're a family-run independent company and have been since 1860. So from uh, initially as farmers, we've diversified over the last 20 years into a uh, farm shop, butchers, garden centre and cafe. Um, this has meant we've got a better offering to our customers. Uh, Covid came with many challenges, but positives being uh, we were pushed to the forefront of the community's minds once again. Uh, people were unwilling to go to supermarkets, shopped local, wanted local, and therefore we were able to uh, push that to uh, our benefit and to the communities. positives of being able to go from farm to farm shop instantaneously is that the consumer is getting absolute freshest produce that they can get, much fresher than the supermarkets and hopefully this will transform consumers way of thinking moving forward. Hello my name is Rick Kenwood, my wife and I own a company called Claire Austin Hardy Plants. We uh, specialise in mail order perennial garden plants that we send through couriers to private individuals. We're e-commerce based, uh, generally don't open to the public, uh, and we're based in San Powers. We've uh, found a phenomenal growth uh, during the period of COVID um, in sales. And as a result, after retaining the initial team, we've now had to add extra staff members um, as part of the team to cope with the demand. Because of COVID, we've had to look at our business model and we've changed now from having a retail outlet to looking at opening the nursery more on open days and doing some retail sales from the site here. We're finding uh, the growth in the internet sales or e-commerce has been phenomenal. As a result of that, we've had to bring extra people into the office and invest in uh, office equipment to cope with the demand. I think the internet um, definitely is a continuing area of growth and will be for the future. So we diversified into pumpkins about four years ago when we went from growing 3,000 to 40,000 pumpkins you see behind me. It's been incredibly popular with families and young children and uh, it brings another dimension to the farm in a time of the year when not a lot is going on. Uh, so we're looking forward to pick your own this year as a safe, socially distanced family activity to be able to do in these uncertain times. Fresh air, space, uh, it couldn't be safer. Because of the increase in demand, we found that we've had to invest a lot in uh, packing materials. The lead times have been phenomenal. Uh, have really uh, blown out from sort of a two week turnaround to a seven week turnaround. The increased costs in addition have made it really hard to for forward plan. And as a result, we've had to sort of more or less stockpile uh, to make sure that we've got sufficient supplies to keep up with the demand. We're finding the demographics of our customers changed and we're now attracting a lot of younger people 
Uh, as a result, they're happier to buy through the internet, not necessarily in person. And also they hold us accountable for our environmental impact and how we uh, go about our business. We've been in business about 20 years and during that time we've always tried to employ local people, support the local economy by uh, using suppliers that are local and um, generally doing our bit to help the community around us. We're fortunate that we employ three people that live probably within a mile and a half radius of the nursery and all the other staff are from a very close proximity. I myself came from a different sector, uh, took a career change to come into the horticulture and agricultural uh, areas. Um, I do feel it is a problem that we're going to have moving forward where uh, a lot of the experience is with the older generation and the younger generation isn't coming through maybe as quick as we would like. With the help of Tuffy though, they do help with a lot of training and uh, that has helped us get unsk unskilled to skilled a lot quicker. I believe uh, the future for farming is in farm tourism. Uh, making farms a destination for people to come to, to enjoy the outdoors, to see the beautiful scenery Wales has to offer and to enjoy its fresh produce, I really do believe is the future for Welsh farming. I believe education and the experience that farms can offer is invaluable and so many people grow up not knowing where food comes from and how it's grown and uh, we can really be the forerunners uh, in doing this and educating people. Whether it's ornamental or horticulture or it's vegetables, Getting people outside into the fresh air, undertaking exercise is fantastic for everybody's mental well-being. I think it just perks everybody up. I think the future uh, for horticulture in Wales is fantastic. I think there's a lot to be done. It's a growing market and I would like to see people uh, embrace it. I'd like to see more locally grown produce and I'd like to see some support from the government to encourage other people into the industry, uh, create more jobs and drive the whole horticultural uh, industry forward. Horticulture in Wales, I do believe, has a fantastic future. We're one of the most beautiful countries in the world and getting people out onto farms, getting them into horticulture, into growing, into local buying is incredibly important. And I believe that the Welsh uh, horticultural industry has a very, very strong future. Thank you. So just to tell you a little bit about Tuffy Cymru, first of all, it's a European funded project run by Lantra through Welsh Government. Um, its aim is to support commercial businesses in the Welsh horticulture sector. That includes edibles, ornamentals, small, large scale, organic, non-organic, the whole range, startup initiatives to well-established businesses. And to be eligible for support, you're, you need to be a registered commercial horticultural business based in Wales and you complete our online business review. What do we offer? We offer industry specific support and training to build capacity and capability of the Welsh horticulture sector. Um, that means that um, that professional development might be technical horticulture training, but it might also be something like digital marketing, business logistics or financial management and a lot of our training and support is delivered through networks we've we've um, developed 31 networks to date so they're things like yes pumpkins you've seen soft fruit vegetables welsh flowers seeds geographical networks um, to give you an idea of, of the range so we source industry experts to deliver workshops and training we're not, we're not horticultural experts by any means ourselves, we just facilitate that process. And the training is designed specifically around the needs of the growers. Um, we also facilitate technical horticulture training with specialist growers and industry professionals. Um, that training is, is sometimes one-to-one, -one, one to few, or it can be in groups. Um, we, we usually get asked by growers, what's the catch? 
because the training and support is actually 100% funded. Um, and we're very fortunate that we've got quite a lot of flexibility with um, how that training and support can be delivered. Um, we're funded until March 2023, so we've just got just less than two years to go. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is a slide to show you some of the achievements to date, but I've, I've got to say the successes of the project are really down to the people that we've worked with and continue to work with, the growers themselves, the contractors, the training providers. We're still a relatively small team, and so in order to achieve scale, we really rely on all those people we work with through our procurement process. And certainly one of the legacies of the project will be a database of specialist horticulture trainers, consultants and specialists that can, can deliver to our growers in Wales. So just moving round from the right hand side, I've mentioned we've supported 226 horticultural businesses. On our database, we've got 430 identified and that number is growing. Um, we've established that number of networks. We provide industry intel for stakeholders like Welsh Government. Um, and this gives you an example of a sort of targeted survey we did. Um, we surveyed our ornamental growers about the impact of, go of transferring to peat free. Um, and 14 of our key businesses responded so we could then formulate those responses and feedback to stakeholders. Um, the Horticultural Alliance Group I'll come back to. Our external evaluators have um, worked out that we're generating a return on investment of £2.25 for every pound spent, which is, which is fortunate. Um, the Horticulture Leaders Forum we've launched, that was delayed, but we managed to launch it this year. That's designed for owners, senior managers and aspiring managers from ambitious horticultural businesses. And eligible businesses will learn from industry specialists delivered through a series of panel sessions, bite-sized masterclasses and one-to-one -one mentoring. So our first panel session was Neil Alcott from Seant, Andrew Burgess, Produce World and Adam from Phytoponics. And anything we deliver like that, like most, is recorded and then put onto our knowledge hub for people to access at a later date. Um, we, we were lucky to respond quite quickly um, at the start of lockdown. Uh, we were able to go online and we've delivered 74 webinars to 644 people during that COVID period. Um, some of that has been, um, you know, sort of webinar training but also it might be network meetings or it might be one-to-one -one delivery. We found that we could still deliver our technical horticulture training on a one-to-one -one online basis, um, surprisingly, and the digital marketing's delivered online and, and that's, uh, that's actually better than trying to do it face-to-face -face, probably. Sorry, um, sorry, we get, we get tremendous... Oh, right, sorry, sorry, right, I'll zoom through. Next. That's fine, no problem, sorry, Amber. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've put together a commercial horticultural action plan um, for Welsh Government, and we've drawn together all our key stakeholders in Wales to form the Wales Horticultural Alliance. I think, I think the part of our USP, I would say, is our consultation with industry. Um, so through large and small directed surveys, grower visits and continual conversations, with growers, stakeholders and partners, we gather that information and we use that information to form our delivery plan. Um, and that enables us to provide that industry voice, represent the sector. And we're currently working with those partners within the Alliance um, to determine how the action plan is being delivered on the ground throughout, through all of us, not just through Tuffy Cymru. So, you know, horticulture is key to Welsh Government's plan to emerge from the pandemic. It's identified in their Green Recovery Task Force. It provides one route to accelerate Wales' transition to a low carbon economy and a healthier, more equal nation. We feel the action plan provides a roadmap and recommends actions to build in line with those Welsh Government strategic objectives. But it's definitely an action plan that involves 
a multi-stakeholder whole supply chain approach um, to um, you know to develop and sustain the whole industry in Wales. How am I doing, Amber? Is that? Um... That's there. I'm afraid just because we're trying to fit in such a lot. No, no, I get that. I was... We're trying to fit in so many. No problem at all. People that I'm going to, we're going to have to move on to talk to, about to Jack. But if anybody's got any questions, please do put them in the chat, and hopefully we'll come back to you at the end. So next, I'd like to introduce. Um, Jack Ward, he heads up British Growers, but he also co-chairs the Fruit and Vegetable Alliance. And he's gonna explain a little bit more about the work of the Fruit and Vegetable Alliance and what they've been up to recently. Thanks, Jack. Great, thank you very much, Amber. And good morning, everybody. It's great to have this opportunity just to very briefly give you an insight into the Fruit and Veg Alliance, which originated with the Food Foundation. It kind of fell out of a piece of work that they were doing probably three or four years ago. Um, it's probably born out of a sense of frustration that fruit and veg um, production here in the UK has largely been underrepresented for most of my professional career, I think. And also, probably more importantly, a sense of opportunity that now we've come out of the common agricultural policy, which actually did very little to support fresh fruit and veg production, and we've moved, now moved into the Agriculture Act, we've effectively found ourselves with a blank sheet. And so part of the role of the Fruit and Veg Alliance is to try and fill in the blank sheet as far as fruit and veg production is in terms of policy requirements. So who is the uh, Fruit and Veg Alliance? We're an eclectic group. I'm not going to name all of the members, because for sure as eggs are eggs, I will leave a few out and that will get me into trouble. But uh, suffice to say, it comprises growers, large growers, small growers, grower cooperatives, grower organisations, and a range of other groups that have got a particular interest in seeing the expansion of the fresh fruit and veg industry here in the UK. Um, one of our roles is to feed into the DEFRA Edible Horticultural Roundtable, um, which is really helpful because it provides us with an interface with the policymakers in DEFRA. Uh, and we have a regular meeting with the, the horticultural team in DEFRA and the uh, Minister Victoria Prentice is a very sort of keen attender of these meetings. And it gives us an opportunity to bounce ideas off the minister and, and the DEFRA team about what we can be doing from a practical viewpoint um, about developing our capability here in the um, fresh produce industry. I think from an overall point of view, our view is that actually there is a really great opportunity to strengthen our productive capacity across um, a wide range of fruit and vegetables um, and meet what we understand and believe to be a growing demand for more fruit and veg um, as people respond to the messages around healthy eating. Um, we've divided our activities into five work streams. Uh, we've got a work stream looking at productivity, which I um, oversee. Uh, and what we're doing here is looking at the opportunities and barriers which exist for all of the fresh produce crops that are grown in the UK and trying to get a picture of what would make most difference in terms of future support for the sector. We've got a group looking at access to labour, skills and new entrants. I mean, it goes without saying, I think the labour issue has already been mentioned. It is critical that we've got a good supply of uh, people who can um, work and uh, drive our, our industry. We've got a group looking at net zero um, farming and sustainability, and they're working very closely with the DEFRA ELMS team to make sure that horticulture is represented in that regard. Uh, we've got a group that looking at routes to market and how we make sure that the supply chain operates fairly and delivers a reasonable share of the returns from the sale of fresh produce back to the growers for um, reinvestment. And last but no, by no means least, we've got a group that looks at consumption, working very closely with the Veg Power campaign around what is it that we can do to drive consumption. So I was particularly interested uh, in you know, the first presentation about what's happening in the Netherlands. So we've got a very ambitious agenda. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight. 
Um, but I think just to reiterate, we do see a lot of opportunities for the fresh produce sector. You know, arguably there are more opportunities than there are for many other sectors within agriculture. And with this new agricultural policy that's coming into being slowly here in the UK, I think there is everything to play for to make sure that we've got a really vibrant, viable and sustainable fresh fruit and veg industry for the future. Thank you, Jack. That's brilliant. Good to hear what the Fruit and Veg Alliance is up to. Um, and we're going to move swiftly on because there's such a lot going on in this space and we want to hear from what's going on in Northern Ireland. So we have um, Adrian and Susie McGowan who are going to, Adrian's going to introduce Susie, who are talk, going to talk about what's happening with Veg um, NI and a new marketing campaign. Thank you, Amber. Uh, good morning. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present our effort as growers to promote the consumption of vegetables in Northern Ireland. Uh, unfortunately, we in Northern Ireland have the lowest consumption of vegetables per head in the UK. Uh, and uh, here recently, we have the unenviable position of uh, the highest consumption of carry out food. So we have a massive uh, challenge here. So while we know our industry is under huge market pressure, there is a job to do to get the public eating healthier diet, uh, putting vegetables at the core. Uh, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> a number of growers came together as Veg and I, and we realized that for to maintain vegetable production in Northern Ireland, we needed to raise the profile and value of local vegetables to the consumer. Uh, we, as Jack has said there, we have a a blank sheet at the moment and uh, we have met with the agricultural minister uh, and Dara to try and influence their decisions and their support uh, going forward to try and improve our industry. Uh, with the assistance of the Dara Food uh, Cooperation Grant we engaged Jack Brennick Studios in London to develop a brand, a website uh, to highlight the benefits to health, the environment and the economy of eating quality local produce. So we hope we are at the beginning of an exciting journey to engage with the public, government and retail to encourage the consumption of more healthy local produce and attract young talent into our industry. Uh, we now have Susie to give a short presentation of our powerful produce, which uh, we hope can be developed into a powerful educational tool in the future. Okay, Susie. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> um, so basically, um, I'm introducing uh, Powerful Produce, which is our, and I'll give you just a quick rundown on um, this initiative that Veg and I are, uh, I'll just present my screen, um, using to kind of inspire customers, inspire consumers, and um, get people to eat more veg. So uh, Dad has introduced, uh, Adrian is my father, as I'm referring to him as Dad. <laughs> so Veg and I, a group of four Irish growers, have come together um, to raise the profile of Northern Irish Veg and create a positive change in the horticulture industry. Why now? And um, this has been covered by many people in this um, this seminar, but, you know, challenging around margins and below cost selling, a bit of a culture of it in Northern Ireland. Um, a bit of lack of broad support for the horticultural industry and crucially a lack of identity for uh, Northern Irish Veg. So we have created a new brand for Veg NI and for Powerful Produce. Um, so Veg NI, we've got this new look and feel, this brand identity that myself um, and my design studio have created. Um, so the crux and the idea that we want to inspire people about is we all know produce and veg is great, but we think Northern Irish produce is powerful. And that comes upon on the accent, you know, but we say powerful rather than powerful. Um, but we, we believe in the, um, in the power of Northern Irish veg to be um, powerful, tasty. So it's, it's tastier, it's better for you. Um, powerful healthy so uh, local veg and um, local produce releases all these great vitamins that's not lost in transit uh, powerful for the planet so as we know it's less food miles um, and better to be buying local than importing uh, it's powerful for your community as well to buy local and for you know the people who drive the produce um, to to the shop to the people who grow it etc um, and it's powerful value as well so it, it's uh, 
goes to waste less quickly. So these are five great reasons that we want to promote local veg. And what we're going to, those are the pillars that will drive home to the customer. We've created these logos that are that people can use in support and um, in in their shops, in their email signatures, etc. And we've created a full brand look and feel that we think brings a kind of contemporary and exciting new way to look at veg um, in quite a modern way. We have also created, and I'll run through this quickly, a new website for Veg NI. Um, which I hope is working. We've got a little animation here of the veg coming to life. It's all very exciting. And um, the website is a great new digital platform that we've built to uh, promote uh, news in the industry, local recipes, um, where the producers are based in Northern Ireland. Um, we've got a grower's directory and we've got uh, where um, uh, you can learn more about the people who grow the veg, uh, which gives information on them. And we have... Um, a produce page which we think has um great opportunity for um education for collaboration with um you know schools and um, we have pages for each of the veg that are grown in northern ireland and information about them uh sorry this is slowing down and um we also have a focus on uh, seasonality so we have an exciting seasonality calendar where we focus on each um of the veg that is at its best in each month. So that's a very quick rundown on the Powerful Produce platform. And I guess we're excited to build on our, um, our relationship with education, our relationship with, um, you know, we've got travel writers involved, nutritionists, et cetera. And we hope that um, all this effort will go to uh, increasing consumption of local veg and the production and the demand for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Susie, and thank you for whizzing through that. That was like a, a mega, mega swift presentation. That's absolutely brilliant to hear about your par powerful produce. <laughs> um, yeah, it's to say for us. Um, OK, great. Thank you so much. It's really good to hear. Next, we're going to quickly hear from Pete, uh, who from Nourish Scotland, who's been leading some work. Um, they've been leading some work on urban horticulture. And then we'll move on to some questions. Thanks, Pete. Great. Hi, I'm going to be really quick. Um, great presentation for everybody. So Pete Ritchie from Nourish Scotland. It's important to say, I agree with Jack, you know, horticulture industry has had a very low profile generally. Um, and NFU Scotland has one person who does everything except livestock. So by the time you've done cereals and potatoes, you know, very small part of their time ends up with veg. And people just don't understand we've got a very, you know, productive and professional veg growing sector in Scotland, you know, middle sized companies supply 24 seven supermarkets, 365 day contracts, farms in different parts of the world. You know, we have a very sort of highly professionalized, large scale veg producing system in Scotland, which is great. We don't eat it any more than they do in the Netherlands, but we, we produce it in spades. But what we're weak on is two areas, particularly the glasshouse sector. And we're doing some work on developing that I could talk about another time. But the other thing is this sort of urban and peri-urban growing thing where there's some really sort of, you know, fantastic pioneers who've been working on that for a while and, 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 and trying to make a living doing that and have built up businesses doing that. But what COVID shows was that there's actually more demand than supply for local veg. You know, there's, a, there's an opportunity there for people to get into that game. Councils in Scotland have to do food growing strategies as part of the Community Empowerment Act. The first round, you know, was a bit ho-ho, um, you know, some good ones, some not so good ones. Dundee did a cracking example of how they could basically meet people's five a day from within the city walls if they put their minds to it. So there's real opportunities, quite a lot of small cities in Scotland, plenty of land. All the cities are built on the best land, you know, the best land in the world is under tarmac. So actually growing, you know, in the best climates is are under tarmac too. So the best place to grow vegetables is in and around the cities. Um, so we think there's a big opportunity to, to grow that sector. We did a report recently on that. And it won't surprise you to know that, you know, there are there are three things that are needed to make that sector thrive. It's not there are some people doing it, but it's a struggle to make a living and it's a struggle to bring new people in because it's a struggle to make a living. There's three things people need. They need access to land, decent land on secure tenancies, you know, that they can actually invest in over time um, and that they can build up fertility in and use some of that urban fertility that's so often wasted to, to build up the, the, the soils that they have. So they need access to land, they need access to skills. There's no way you can learn how to do market gardening in Scotland. And our trip to the Netherlands um, a couple of years ago where we saw Karen, you know, one of the most striking things about the Netherlands is they invest in degree level training for people doing horticulture. It's seen as a proper professional career that you need to be 
you know good at good at it's not it's not a career for people who don't know what else to do and it's still seen too often that way in schools and colleges it's sort of what what people do when they don't know what else to do um the netherlands is just exemplary in terms of making this proper professional training so we're recommending this proper professional training for market gardening in scotland where you can actually go and you've got not just learning how to do it but also have a career in it um, and the third thing that people need are resources, particularly to get them started and for the first five or 10 years before the business breaks even. Um, and we're suggesting that some of the revised cap money in Scotland, you know, when we, we, we're a bit behind Wales and England in terms of um, redirecting the, the cap funding. But as we develop that scheme, we're recommending that a percentage of it goes to local authorities and that local authority use that money to invest in small scale urban and peri-urban production. Um, either on a, you know, percent of sales will subsidize you 10% or 20% on your sales or, or we'll give you a grant of up to £10,000 or whatever it is, but something that's um, based on the delivery of public goods, public goods in terms of these, these holdings have to be agroecological, they have to show biodiversity gains, they have to provide um, some community cohesion, some education of kids, you know, they have to actually deliver public goods, but I think that's quite possible for urban and peri-urban um, food growing enterprises to do that. So we're suggesting this needs an investment of public funds to make the most of the opportunity um, to, to grow that sector with all the benefits that come with it. I'll stop there because I think we should have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete, for that very quick run through. I know you're doing a lot to support the horticulture sector and look forward to seeing the, that urban food plan coming, coming together. Um, you've got one question in the chat, so we think we should go to that straight away, just then we'll come back to some of the other questions. Um, Ari, the glass sector, is that linked in with the Highland Good Food Partnership? Uh, yes. Yeah, good. That was a quickie. Very good. Um, there's been quite a few questions in the chat about nutrient density of fruit and veg. Is any, any of the speak any of the speakers so far, are you looking at the nutrient density of fruit and vegetables or um, is it just about getting people to eat more veg and producing more veg or are you considering the nutrient density of fruit and veg? Karen, anything from the Netherlands? Is that something you look at or? Yes, yes, we are. Of course, uh, a high quality, of, it starts with a high and good quality of the product to help people to eat healthier. So we are looking into the nutrient density. There's a study going on to compare all the different food and vegetables, how they are growing, are growing at the moment and what they are, uh, have, what's in it as a nutrient density. And I think that will be maybe published next year. But um, there are always a little bit worries about when you're producing at such a big scale, is the product then uh, really healthy? Is it nut nutrient density? And what we show so far is yes, the nutrients are there, but the best thing you can do and tell the consumers is you have to use a variety of products. That's why we say color your plate, use all colors there are so that you get all these different nutrients from the different products. So the main message still is variety and that we are looking into the new chance in this too. yes okay that, that's good that's good to hear um i wanted to come back on some somebody said about banning junk food advertising well of course we've got that ban coming in so there's an opportunity now um for us to try and increase the amount of vegetable um advertising but of course we know that it's if you look in veg, veg facts the most recent figures 1.9 percent of food and drink advertising spend goes on veg advertising so we've got some way to go in terms of that um there was a question about um how much how many pumpkins are being eaten does anybody know does anybody know <laughs> that's something we'll have to look into um and another question around um, small scale and what's being done to support the small scale as well as the large scale um, does anybody want to um, repeat? Well, I, th I think that's what I was trying to say, Amber, was that, um, you know, we have very professional, well-established large-scale veg producers, you know, in the fertile regions of Scotland. We don't have them so many in and around our cities, and there's lots of land. There's more, there's more derelict land, bacon and derelict land in Scottish cities than we use for fruit production, for example. You know, there's lots of land available. Um, and, but I think what you need is a, a, just as we have, you know, for the farming sector in Scotland and in Wales, we recognise that, you know, you need to provide support to farmers where there are natural disadvantages, which make it difficult to make a living while there's social benefits from having them there. 
you know, so in our remote communities, there's real social benefits to maintain an agriculture sector, even though it's really hard to make a living there. You know, and we feel exactly the same about urban farming and small scale farming, that you need to have the social reasons for having that ecosystem of small scale producers. Um, but it's really hard to make a living without subsidies, certainly for the first few years. And people try all sorts of schemes and wheezes and things to create a business model that works, but everybody knows it's really difficult. Um, you know, so we're suggesting that steady long-term funding is available through the replacement of the cap to support specifically that sector and recognize that sector as being part of our you know, overall agriculture food production system, that's all. Um, I'd like to bring in Jack um, here, Jack, um, in terms of um, financial support for the horticulture sector. Um, we know it's been slow, but we know um, there's an opportunity now with um, ag bill reform to for the horticultural sector to 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 get to sort of gain some funds from that. Is there anything you'd like to to ask for? You know, what what do you need in terms of the sort of the larger scale, as we've heard from Pete about the smaller scale? Okay, I think um, the conversation that's going on at the moment is, uh, you know, if you were to try and look at, pitch, picture yourself 10 years down the line, where would we want to be with our fresh produce industry and what do we need to get there? Um, and to my mind, the sort of areas that we would look at for support and encouragement would be things like research and development, which is hugely important, and is very difficult to justify and finance in, in some parts of the industry because there are so few producers and comparatively small areas, but it's, it nevertheless remains norm, enormously important. So research and development would be one area, uh, capital investment might be another area, robotics and automation would be another area, crop protection, uh, sustainability, zero carbon might be another area. And then there are other bits and pieces, waste minimization, possibly. And, you know, looking at these or just trying to have an overall vision of what would make the biggest difference to the sector and then look at how you could best support those activities on behalf of, you know, all growers, large and small. Okay, I think that's quite a nice place to end. Sorry, but we haven't got time for further discussion. And I think there's a lot more to be said here. There's a lot more we could do across the nations in terms of um, talking to each other about what's being done. And hopefully we can facilitate some of those conversations through Peas, Please. I'd just like to sort of end by saying like five years ago, the, 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 none of these things were happening so much and there's a lot more going on. So there's this there's a lot of hope going on. There's veg power, there's peace, please. There's, you know, all these different things coming. There's powerful produce now, there's Tuffy Cymru. You know, we've got a lot of learning. And I liked what um, Karen said about the importance of collaboration um, moving forward. And I think um, I think there's some power in that. Power being one of the, um, the titles of the day, I think. Um, but I think there's power in collaboration and look forward to working more with you all going forward. Going back to those stats at the beginning, um, the three million more tons that are needed that's 37 billion more portions of veg that we need to be available or be people to eat um, so we've got a long way to go um, but I think we we are getting somewhere and I, I like the way everybody's working together and it's really good to see and I'm, I hope this um, has been interesting for people to learn what's going on in different places thank you so much from to Karen from the Netherlands thank you to Sarah to Jack to Adrian and Susie and to Pete thank you all so much for um for your insight. I'm sorry we haven't got longer, but I think short and sweet is a good way to end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amber. It was great.